you know, uh, it's very interesting that the, in this forum, like lawyers and, and, and the linguists, they are sitting together. Even uh, 10 years ago, if you ask me, I never thought that there is any connection between law and language. I had no uh, idea about it until I met uh, Professor Bhatia, who roped me in the legal English, and then Christoph in, in the legal English work. And we did a couple of these works at that time. And I slowly started learning the power of linguist or power of language in law. And that's how I realized. And very recently, it was confirmed. There was a seminar like this going on. And the question was asked that what is the difference between or is there any difference between complete and finish? Lawyers, as Jenny said, they took out Oxford Dictionary because they are trained in Vienna Convention. They know that odd plain ordinary meaning always comes from the dictionary. They open the dictionary, they find no difference. I said, mm. after looking at, after following Article 31 of the Vienna Convention, looking at Oxford Dictionary, there is no difference. Ordinary meaning, same. So, lawyers did not answer. They asked the layman, they said, there is nothing, no difference. And then there was a linguist who come up and said that, well, I can tell you the difference. If you marry to a right woman, your life is complete. <laughs> if you marry to a wrong woman, your life is finished. <laughs> and if the right woman finds you with the wrong woman, your life is completely finished. <laughs> so that's the difference. That's the power of linguists. And I am now starting and I'm believing that there is something over there. And that's how we did. And thankful to uh, Christoph for this project and involving me. When we were involved, I was in CTU. So I was thinking that, OK, naturally, I can be partner of him. And that also happened by mistake in the mid of the night when he came to see our moot coaching training and he wanted to come and see. And our sessions were going longer and longer. And he was sitting over there until midnight, totally drowsy and still taking notes and recording and everything. So after a few weeks, we asked him, Christoph, what is your view on that? What do you do? And then he started saying that, oh, in the first draft, you said this and this. And the first speech, you said this and this. The student said this. You corrected like this. Then the next time, they wrote like this. I said, oh my god, you got all those things? And we had no idea that we were doing it. So then we came up with this idea. He came up with this idea. I joined. Then I left to Australia. And still, he was so kind to rope me in and I still been there. So thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me for this half-day conference all the way, traveling nine hours for this one. So thank you, Kirsten. <laughs> very generous of you. Now, <clears throat> the, the topic uh, which uh, I'm going to talk about, the oral advocacy, is because we wanted to include in this project not only the legal writing, but also the idea about how to speak. And there is a big difference. You can write in a different way. You can create a different impression by writing a different impact. But when you have to say the same thing in short time and, and directly, then it has a different technique. And that's what we learn from our own perspective. And that also like because my dean, uh, no law deans are here at this moment. They should be here to, to listen to that. When my dean said that, Rajesh, you have to coach a team to make them world champion. And I was thinking that, wow, oh my god. I look at our student, I look at Hong Kong students <laughs> everywhere, and I say that, how I'm going to do that? And then involving in the VIS mood for 15 years, I took out all those examples. And the first example which came for me from Hong Kong was Jin Pao. You remember him? Yes, he was a brilliant speaker, natural speaker from Hong Kong U, who did very well in Jessup. And after that, we didn't see any. So I remember that guy was somewhere. Then in Vienna, I met one girl from Monash University. She was so smooth that really impressed, and the team won single-handedly. Then I met uh, another student um, in, in, from NUS Singapore who came for the first time, and he was fabulous over there, and he won. So I had a couple of examples, and I thought that how I'm going to train that, to that kind of a student. And then I looked at around, and I said that what I need in my student to win that, the first thing I need, the rigor, the content, and the rigor of German students because they are very good at that. Then I need the smoothness and the structure of Australian students. Even in the heavy bombardment of question, they don't leave their structure and they stick to that. So I needed that kind of a thing. I needed American team who can sell the idea like a marketing person. I needed like a street a smartness of Indian student who can answer any question <laughs> anyway, like you know, that kind of a thing. And then I needed somebody 
looking at Hong Kong, the local effect is that I wanted somebody of a Chinese face, but the Singaporean perfect English. <laughs> so basically, I was looking for a superhuman. And we had the trust, we had the faith in our student, and we wanted to do that. And we did find that, and we did achieve that. And I have a perfect example, and in this, you have seen the video, you, have, you will be seeing more video, and I have two students here who will be joining me on this one, Harp and Eric. They learned as a motor, they were the champion, they brought the glory, and now they are here with us, like, you know, working on this one. So they will be also joining me on some part of it, okay? So that was the idea. Now, uh, when we started that, then we had to always find out that what is the good advocacy we are looking at. People have given uh, different views about it, but what we were looking at from our perspective, I don't know, Audrey, Audrey also has said her video, you can see that, what do you mean by that? And I can also say that one thing, is that our view, view is, and we believe in that, not believe the way written believe like a barristers, they say it. But we see that a good advocacy, you know, it may not win the case. It may not win the case because for that you need the evidence and all those things. If there's totally a weak case, you can't win. But a good advocacy can win the heart of the judges, the audience, and that may help you later and that can give you. So this is our idea. So what is this? This is a kind of a skills which we can teach, we can train. Some people are born natural speakers, some people can be made like that. So we found that there should be some kind of a common denominator, common set of a skill which we can translate and instill into a students who can combine and who can do the perfect thing. Because we are looking at the local and global part, the best part, the, the mood which we were doing in Vienna, 300 teams coming from all over the world, civil law, continental law, common law, different kind of law, Different kind of speaking, different languages, Spanish, and on the judge we have like, you know, different people. So we wanted to have a, some kind of a common sense, some kind of a common speech, so that everybody can understand and the impact should be on everyone. So that kind of a thing we wanted to teach them another. What happened is that because of the mooting, some students got some kind of a skill, but not everyone. And that's why we had a kind of a common course. So it's, it's that kind of a thing. So what we found that what is lacking in the Hong Kong students or, or, or any students, I'm not talking about only CTU students, I'm counting all Hong Kong students in that one. So we found that there's a lack of a structure, the lack, a lack of a style, some content part was there, question and answer were like a problem, time management was a problem, and how to engage the tribunal for 40 minutes, 60 minutes, that was also a kind of like, you know, big problem with that. So we, we found that common problem. So those common problem, how we can address it, there is no shortcut to success. It is hard work. It is hard work. And that's why the preparation, practice, and inspiration is needed for that. And that's why I gave you the example of those three students and four students which we, I told you, they were my inspiration, which I wanted to get it and cl club it together and put it there. Practice, we did quite a lot, and preparation, of course, is there. So these are the like shortcut uh, you can have uh, this kind of thing. And that's why I asked uh, Christoph to include in this project audio part, the video part, and, and also the advocacy part, because I needed that. I wanted to teach a student in mooting class, but I had uh, no perfect example of it. I had no example with video and explanation. So he was very happy and, and, and very good to put it together, and we put this kind of thing together. And that's what we want. We want to have give, like, you know, natural speakers as well as other speakers to sharpen their skills and give them those common things which they need to in that one. Very things, like, you know, if you look at that, what are the things it includes? It includes in the oral advocacy in our part, many other things, but main focus, <laughs> we are going to do it here, is that a good advocacy is also like you know, good introduction. It involves in that one. Good start means we are do talking about a case theory in that. Uh, it should have a good roadmap. It should have a good question and answer technique. Uh, a smart and creative use of facts and law. And rebuttal, sir rebuttal, and a good conclusion in that. So all these things are there. Plus, there are many other things which you can find in our video, but we are going to focus on a couple of these things here. The very first thing why we say introduction, everybody thought that in oral advocacy and introduction, what is the relationship? And I tell you that what was the relationship and what is there. Many times we have seen in Vienna, mooting starts at 4 o'clock in the evening, and the team comes and say, good morning, Mr. Arbitrator and members of the tribunal. The moment you say good morning, everyone says, what, good morning? You have no sense? Then you see another team which starts at 11 o'clock 
and the second team comes at 12 after 12 uh, o'clock and he comes and he said a good afternoon madam president and members of the tribunal everybody remembers that ah he is watching his time he knows his am or pm or morning or evening so this kind of a things we call it we see that we have to start on the right foot and and the saying goes well begun half done and we say that introduction is that part. So we focus on that one also. How to address the tribunal, how to address the bench. It's very important that you start on that kind of a thing. And that's how we did it. Even the simple thing, whether you should call it Mr. Chairman or Mr. President. There is a discussion on that one. And we teach them, we teach them that in order to find out whether you should say Chairman or President, go and look at the rules. It says that you should say Chairman or the President. It says over there and you can follow that one. So this is the introduction part, a small part but very important part of it and the right footing we say that you must do that. That's the one thing. Then the very start, this is the classic one liner we call it case theory. And we ask our student to work on that, how can you tell in one or two lines what is your case about, why you are here, what do you get, that kind of a thing and think about it as students have worked for eight months prepare so many things and we are asking them to tell me in two lines, it was completely difficult task for them. But if you look at all these great lawyers, whenever we give them their example, we always quote their one liners. And this is what we, we, call, we say that case theory should be there. And we ask our student to develop this case theory right from the beginning. We start thinking about it. But the fact is, even till the date of moot, we don't have a perfect or we don't get the perfect case theory. We don't get the perfect opening. Then we go to the moot. We try one, we do it another, we modify it. All those things are there and I'm very happy that our two students, they were very good at creating uh, this case theory and I didn't have to work too much on that one. So this is the starting point is very important. And I can just show you a little bit on that one that why this uh, case theory is important and what is the impact of that. Hi, welcome back. I'm Eric and this is the Quick Guide to Oral Advocacy. Today, we'll take a look at how to state a case theory, which allows judges to understand the essence of your case in a few sentences. You'll learn how to portray the opponent's case in a negative light by showing a contrast and using emotive language, maintain an assertive tone by avoiding modals such as may and might, when you're stating your case theory, there are two strategies that you can use to portray the opposing party's case in a negative light. The first is presenting a contrast. First, you let judges know what is supposed to happen ideally. Then, you tell them what the opponent has done in actual fact. Let's see how Lavesh makes use of this contrasting strategy. Here, he portrays the respondent's case in a negative light as he states a case theory in relation to procedural issues. Mr. President, members of the tribunal, in any arbitration agreement, there are two key elements. One is consent and the other is good faith, both of which have been breached by the respondent in this particular case. The respondent is now using dilatory tactics in seeking to object to this tribunal's jurisdiction and is also seeking to admit a amicus brief into these proceedings neither of which should be allowed. If you were hearing this arbitration, you'd probably be thinking that the respondent has been a bit remiss. That's because Lavesh first highlights the importance of consent and good faith in an arbitration agreement. Then, he immediately asserts that the claimant has breached these two elements. This forms a sharp contrast and draws attention to the respondent's flaws. The same strategy can be observed in another example featuring harp. It takes two people to tango and the same goes for the performance of a contract. The claimant had performed its obligations under the contract by delivering the tobacco products and the merchandise. But when the time came for the respondent to perform its responsibilities under the contract, it conveniently shifted them to the Gondwanan government. Harp contrasts the exemplary conduct of the claimant with the rather less desirable behavior of the respondent. In the same example, 
Harp makes use of a second strategy. He uses emotive language, which attempts to influence what judges think of the respondent. Take another look at the last part of Harp's case theory, and notice the way he uses the word conveniently. But when the time came for the respondent to perform its responsibilities under the contract, it conveniently shifted them to the Gondwanan government. Here, the adverb conveniently clearly implies that the respondent is simply acting out of self-interest, sidestepping its obligations for its own convenience. The respondent is not portrayed as acting in any kind of responsible way. As you state your case theory, stay assertive. Never use modals such as may and might, which lower the degree of certainty. If you watch the two examples again, you'll find that the tone remains assertive throughout. So remember, when you state your case theory, you can portray the opponent's case in a negative light by presenting a contrast and using emotive language. You should stay assertive and avoid using words that make what you say less certain. In the next episode, we'll talk about how to present a roadmap. Stay with us and see you soon. This video, like you know, when we were making, we wanted to emphasize that the case theory has a very important part to play in oral advocacy. And that's how we wanted to teach a student to learn and to understand that how they can summarize their case in one or two sentences. So that's the idea, like you know, and we didn't have any video of such kind in, in our uh, bank. So this is the first one we have come up with this and with different examples. So we put it that. So that's why we find that this kind of like you know project is very valuable in teaching because now here we have a narrative, we have video, we can show them, show the students that how it is done and how they can do it. Now, if you look at after that, we have to do the roadmap. Everybody can say the roadmap. It's a very common. They remember, I have to argue three points, A, B, C, they can say that. But the problem is they can't maintain that roadmap all the through for 20, 30 minutes. But when you are giving the roadmap, there are several things it happens. You have to give the signpost when you are moving from which argument to which argument, how you are going back or forward in that kind of a thing. You also have to cite the facts and law. Look, when you are writing the cases law, it's facts is very different. You can create a different impact. But when you are speaking it, it's a very different. I can give you an example. In the case, when you are writing it, you can say that case A versus B, a, a all England report, page number this and this, and you can just write and do it. It's a different thing. But when you are speaking it, how you can say that? When you are giving the facts, you can say that para line number one, paragraph five, page number 15. That's the way you say it. But if you look at the practicality side of it, what we see, we have to make the life easier for the judges. If you think about it, we have only like, you know, if you say line one, paragraph five, how can they reach to the line one, paragraph five? We have to say in a reverse order. You say page 15, line five, paragraph, uh, li uh, paragraph five, line number one. That's how he will open the page and go 15, paragraph five, and then line. What generally we do? Do we say it other way around? So these are the technique like, you know, we have to find case theory, like cases which we are citing. We have to say court, party's name, court name, year of, uh, year of a judgment and then the page number. Somebody argued that why we are using page number is too much is why we have to say page number. But this was our strategy we use it. And then when the video was uploaded of the Vienna moot, later on we saw that how many hits were there. And then next year when we went there, everybody was using page number. Be considered that gives authenticity to your work. Research, it shows that what you can do. It is your real work. Page number this, you can find that. This is the, the impact which creates. That is what we say. When we have to argue, we develop our own local strategy. We call it one, two, three strategy or facts, law, and policy. When you have to argue, which one you should say first, facts or law or policy? We say that no, we will go for the facts first because the agreed first or what, facts or whatever the facts are there is very important and we can show them first. Then we can use the law and then the policy is the last argument we can do. So these are the strategy we, we try to use it in our roadmap and everything. So far as the question is concerned, this is also another part of it, but I want um, the question aspect for the harp to explain it that how he has developed that. And the reason I invited them and, uh, to be with me and sharing my time is, is the one reason is that they learned it 
and now they are barrister, they are using in a court. So, they are the perfect example of a student who is turning into a lawyer, a professor, professional and then how he is using that technique. So, Hop, your turn. Thank you for that. I'm just going to make a quick confession before I begin that Rajesh taught me mooting back in CityU, Vandana taught me advocacy on the PCLL and Judge Moffat taught me on the bar course. <laughs> so, whatever I say is the combination of all three. So, it has to be correct. Um, question answering. Typically, when I started doing question and answering, my problem was I was a bit like going completely around the circle, trying to protect my client's interests without actually answering the question. So, if the question would be like, did your client do it? I would say, well, looking at the facts, you know, the other side did this, the other side did that. I wouldn't really answer the question directly. And that was a tendency on my behalf to somehow protect my client's interest or somehow protect my case without actually answering the question to think somehow, you know, there might be an answer in there, we'll let the judge decide without actually pointing out the flaws in my case. So Rajesh taught me that when you're asked a question, you gotta answer it. So did your client do it? Yes, he did. Or no, he didn't. And then you give the answer if the judge wants the explanation or if he doesn't. And I had a, I had a professor back in, uh, in Oxford when I was studying there and I tried to do the same technique of giving me a runaround. And he's like, well, my dear boy, this is not mathematics. If I want the answer or the explanation, I'll ask for it. But if I want the answer, just give me the answer, yes or no. So that really struck a chord with me that sometimes it is in your beneficial interest to answer the question directly because the audience is the one deciding the ultimate uh, issue or case. So the technique that we've learned, and then Vandana also reinforced it, which actually works as well in, when I go to court, is when you ask the question, yes or no answer, with a short explanation, not more than a sentence or two, <coughs> and if there's further inquiries, then you can certainly explain it by saying, this is the reference, this is where you can find more answers. And sometimes there's also an interesting technique in the sense that there's two ways that you can approach a question from the bench. One is you can answer it then and there. So if you're like starting off with your case theory and the judge is like, well, you know, counsel, I've read the case, I'm more interested in this aspect of the case, which is somewhere down the road in your arguments. And some counsel I've seen will say, well, my learned judge, that's a great question. We know I'll, I'll answer it in about 15 minutes when I get there. <laughs> so that, that so Vox, my pupil master, was, I was like, why didn't you answer the question then and there? Well, I haven't really thought about it. But if I postpone it for 15 minutes, I can think about it and possibly she, he or she might either forget the question or we might get a 15 minute adjournment or we'll delay it until the next day and then I might have an answer for her. So I was like, is that a good tactic? Or he says, that's the, thing, the only thing I have. I mean, if you decide to answer the question then and there, you don't really have an answer. You look like A, a fool, or B, that you haven't really done the preparation on your case. But I said, isn't there a counter problem with that, that the, that the judge already has that impression? if you fail to answer that question then there. He's like, well that's the risk you have to roll with sometimes. You gotta roll the dice and expect them not to have that impression. So he says the best you can do is prepare for the case. If you can't answer the question, answer it. Be direct and succinct. But if you can answer it, at least somewhere down the line you do end up answering the question and not just completely evading it. But you do find some judges, which I found through my court experience, tend not to let me wiggle out and say, well I'm not really interested in the rest of it. I want the answer now. So you do have that situation, you do your best. So the approach we've seen is answer, give a short explanation, and if they want something more, give it to them, but if they don't, move on. That is my view on Q&A, thank you. Hi, <laughs> I'm Eric. <laughs> uh, welcome to a quick guide, oh wait, no, sorry. Uh, not doing the video. Um, I'm also one of Rajesh's students. Uh, I was uh, a mooter in 2013 uh, for the Viz Vienna competition. Uh, I'm just going to give a, a quick uh, overview of some of the other things that we've learned, one of which uh, is rebuttal. Uh, rebuttal and sir rebuttal is uh, one of the hardest things that, uh, we're, that we have to teach our students, uh, that we have to teach uh, anybody who's going through the mooting program and any uh, advocate. Uh, now, in the previous session, there had been some discussion about genres, how language tends to change depending on uh, the genre or the type of, um, uh, of what your audience is looking for. Now, in oral advocacy, that's the same, but 
in a submission or an argument, there's actually uh, several subgenres, and rebuttal is one of those subgenres. Rebuttal is something which has its very unique sort of style, which in that is the last chance for the claimant to make any argument or to leave any impression in the mind of an arbitrator or a judge. Uh, rebuttal is also something which has to arise out of what the respondent has normally said. So it's something that people have to prepare, either prepare in advance, or which they have to come up with during the argument. So for students and for especially people who are learning uh, the art and science of oral advocacy, it's one of the hardest things that they have to do. A lot of times we'll, we'll see a student come in through the mooting program and we ask them to do a rebuttal and they say, I'd like to spend 10 minutes on my rebuttal. I have 15 points I want to address. <coughs> you know, um, and what always happens is by the time they get to point 13 or 14 or 15, the arbitrator or the judge is just snoozing because they've gotten through 13 points uh, which don't necessarily help the case. And so what we always try to teach is that, we should, that rebuttal should be short, it should be sharp, it should be ideally two points or three points at maximum and within a short period of time. And the reason for that is that if you do it that way, it creates a lasting impression. And the, remember the tool set for oral advocacy is different from writing. Inflection, tone, language, all, all of which uh, are now at uh, your disposal. And rebuttal, that's when you can put that into play. Uh, we, you know, I, we always gave the analogy that we consider uh, a moot match or a, a, any sort of dispute, uh, oral hearing really, to be sort of a boxing match. You know, and your intro and your case theory are sort of your, your, your first couple of punches, your main arguments, your, your body of your arguments or your body blows, but your rebuttal and your surrebuttal, if you're, if you're granted it, are simply your knockout punches. And like any knockout punch, it's got to be short and sharp. And that's how we teach our students to uh, prepare rebuttal and serve rebuttal. Now let me talk quickly about serve rebuttal. Although it's generally not available to respondent, this is also one of the hardest things, if not the hardest thing to teach our students because not only does serve rebuttal have to arise out of what came out of the uh, claimant's points in rebuttal, it's usually not something which you can prepare very well in advance. And if a, if a party is uh, conducting a rebuttal uh, properly and they're only spending a minute or two minutes on their rebuttal, you don't have a lot of time. And so for students, this is one of the key parts to learn. It's a skill uh, and another subgenre where if you learn uh, that skill, it makes you a far, far more effective advocate. Um, and again, uh, keep it short and keep it sweet, just like I'm keeping this presentation. <laughs> uh, conclusion and closing. Always want to keep, uh, always want to bookend things. Uh, Rajesh had talked about uh, how you introduce uh, the case, have a case theory, have an introduction. Well, you want to bookend that because by the end of the submission or the end of the argument, it's possible that some of that uh, key facts or key information has gone by the wayside. And so you want to create sort of a, a soft landing that helps remind the, uh, the arbitrator or the judge about the case theory. And uh, Rajesh always uses the term big bang. Um, and I like to say that it's, again, the chance to use the tools at your disposal, using tone, using inflection, using timing, using pace, all of which you get with oral advocacy and not so much with written advocacy. And so you want something which will last and which will uh, stay in the mind of whoever's deciding it. And uh, you know, we, see, we also see a lot of teams who simply say, Yo, I'm, uh, I've, I've reached my time limit, uh, I'm just gonna stop there. You know, always want to at least wrap things up and keep 20 to 30 seconds to yourself so that you give a proper conclusion. Uh, and this is, these are the skills and these are the certain subgenres that we were talking about uh, in preparing for oral advocacy. Uh, and in conclusion, uh, it's a lot of skills. It's a lot of skills, but they're definitely teachable. I think Harp and myself are proof of that. Uh, I think Harp and I, I mean, we both were uh, native English speakers, but we didn't really have the skills. We didn't really know what we were doing. Um, and you know, it was Rajesh and his skills and his teaching and his method which helped uh, form us into the advocates. And these are skills which we are still using today uh, as barristers. So thank you. Very nice to say that I thought about now they are far ahead than me, like you know. <laughs> it's, uh, so this one, but the one thing we have to understand, and at the end we tell our student that we can teach you everything, but it's like a football game. 
when you go to the field we can tell you that you are right hand uh, you you play for the right side you play for the right side left side you go from the center and the ball will come here here and you will pass here and then you will make the goal then he will be the striker but then at the end of the day if my defender has an opportunity to kick the ball in the goal post should he follow my instruction that no 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 i cannot i cannot kick my coach said that somebody else will come and kick that's not and that's what he say once you are on your feet you are on your own you have to make your own judgment feel your instinct and go with that and do it and that's the way you can do it we can teach you a skill but finally you have to kick the goal you have to make the goal and that any opportunity you get it you do it and that's the key point of it and the classic example was a rebuttal generally comes at the last but the moot which we won and harp was mooting here in ha in, in in hong kong he has started with rebuttal he has started with the rebuttal and that was totally instinctive and that's the point we knew that okay we nailed the other side so it was done deal after that so this was very instinctive but he used it and it worked for that so that's why we have to understand the skills are there but we also have to give the natural talent so ultimate goal of this project is to share our our experience what we have learned from our mistakes we want to share with everyone not only in hong kong students not only city u student but all students of hong kong and we also want to share with all other students around the world what we have made the mistake you don't have to make the same mistake and you don't have to reinvent the wheel just follow just see that and that's why the videos are so important so thank you christoph for your project and getting us involved so thank you very much <laughs>